In 2009, I met my wife, and, and while we were dating, I did everything I could to show her I was husband material. And one time in particular, um, I lived in the green district of Roseburg. I had a little trailer there, and I invited her over to make cookies because I wanted her to know, honey, if you marry this guy, it's cookies all day long, okay? Like, I'm enamored with this girl. She's awesome. She loves Jesus. And so I'm pursuing her wholeheartedly. I have her come over, and we're going to make some cookies. The only problem is I don't know how to make cookies, and I don't have a recipe, I just remember vaguely what my mom would put into a bowl when I was a kid, when I used to help her make cookies. And I had most of those ingredients. I figured we'll be okay. Don't worry about it. So she comes over and I just start putting stuff in a bowl and it looks pretty weird. It looks like just just gelatinous mold. And, And she's like, is it supposed to look like that? And my response, of course, because I want to be calm, cool, and collected is, yeah, this is exactly what I'm trying to make. (laughs) Although I have no idea what I'm trying to make. And so we slapped those cookies in the oven and I had no idea how long to cook them for. Um, So I put a timer on, I think it was for uh, like five minutes. And when I opened the oven to look at the cookies, it, it was though they were looking back at me. Like I had some created some biological experiment in my oven. Like if we were to eat these cookies, I'm pretty sure they would eat us back, right? Because I didn't know what I was making and I didn't know how to make it. And ultimately, uh, my wife still married me. So it worked, guys, make your, make your ladies cookies. But, but I didn't know what I was making and I didn't know how to make it. And throughout our DNA series, we've been coming back to what does Jesus say about disciple making? Because I'm afraid far too often, we're much like me in a kitchen trying to make chocolate chip cookies. We're just throwing things at the wall, hoping that they stick in our disciple making. And we went through this series where we began with Jesus's vision of the church, that he has this unstoppable view of the church. In the second week, uh, Pastor Drew talked about what it means to be people helping people. The first part of our mission statement, that that we should be people who not just share the gospel, but our own selves as well from 1 Thessalonians 2. Then Pastor Jeremy uh, taught us on the idea of what it means to help people find Jesus. Like, what is it? How do I share the gospel? And we talked about listening to the spirit, listening to others and pointing them to Christ. And today we're going to land the plane on our mission statement with the last part of it. People helping people find and follow Jesus. People helping people find and follow Jesus. We're going to zoom in on that aspect of what it means to help others follow Jesus. And as you can see, we're going to be kind of all over the New Testament. And that's uncomfortable for me, to be honest with you. I, I prefer to just sit in a passage and let's dig in. Um, but, but the idea of people helping people find and follow Jesus is all over the New Testament. And so we're going to look at several different passages where we can see this begin to be played out. And, and it's so cool because we have a mission statement that encapsulates what God did in the new covenant. Like that's so awesome. So how do we actually begin to live this out? We're going to come back to the recipe, so to speak, and figure out what did Jesus do to make disciples? How did Jesus define a disciple? And then from there, how did Jesus make disciples? We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 4 to begin with. Verse 18 is where we're starting. Jesus has begun his earthly ministry, and he's about to call his first disciples. Let's look at it. Matthew 4, 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he's on a leisurely stroll, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter. We remember Peter, right? Peter's the guy who anytime there's a question, he's got to pipe up. He puts his foot in his mouth nonstop. We talked about him at the beginning of the series. He rebukes Jesus, and then Jesus rebukes him by saying, get behind me, Satan. So Peter's there and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus met Andrew and Peter. In fact, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist when John was in the wilderness and and baptizing people for repentance. People are coming out to him. And Jesus shows up on the scene and John sees Jesus and says, look, oh my word, it's, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm not even worthy to touch that guy's shoes. 
And Andrew's like, see you, John. If that's the Lamb of God, I'm following him. He gets his brother Peter and they meet Jesus. So this isn't the first time they met each other, but they're on the shore. They're, they're working in their boat on their nets. They're casting into the sea to catch fish. This is what they did. This is their day job. It's how they, uh, they provided for themselves and their family. It was their livelihood. These are common, unlearned men. These aren't the spiritually elite. These are, they don't have political power. They don't have a lot of influence. And look at what Jesus does. And he said to them, he is Jesus, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus sees these common men and he invites them into an uncommon mission. Like that's astounding. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And look at it. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. They like, leave their livelihood behind. And I'm following this guy now. And, and as I was reading through this passage the other day, it startled me that Jesus begins this relationship with Andrew and Peter with the expectation that one day they will be released into the mission. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm not a fisherman, okay? <laughs> so when I hear Jesus' words, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be a fisher of men. Bigger pole, bigger hook, this is going to get bloody, right? But he used something that they would have understood uh, as fishermen as an analogy for the mission. You're no longer going to catch fish. You're going to bring people into the kingdom of God. That's what your life is going to be about. And so immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is a, a, a huge faith step. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with the Zebedee, their father. Apparently fishing on the Sea of Galilee is, is a family business. And so here's another family, and they're providing for their livelihood. And Jesus sees James and John and their dad and they're mending their nets. And he called them. Same thing that he just did to Andrew and Peter. Immediately, they left the boat and their father. <laughs> like Peter and Andrew left the boat. But these guys are like, see you, dad. Can you put yourself in the parents' shoes for a second? Like the <laughs> your kid comes to you and says, hey, dad, um, I'm going to go live with this guy, follow this guy, sit under his teaching. Um, he's homeless, jobless. Like it almost sounds like joining the circus. But James and John knew about Jesus. They had heard about him. They had interaction. And so they had this desire to begin to follow the Lamb of God. And they take an immense faith step, immediately leaving their livelihood and their family behind to follow Jesus. And I want to come back to that statement that Jesus said to Andrew and Peter. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's a cause and effect there. If we follow Jesus, this will be the result. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Cause and effect. I put it this way. Following Jesus results in making followers of Jesus. Following Jesus results in making followers of Jesus. And the other day, Pastor Ed kind of tipped my apple cart over. Uh, he showed us a video that I had seen before, but it just set with me differently. And in the video, the, the guy who wrote a book called Future Church, he, he talks about how God's people are, are, are focusing on Jesus's words and Jesus's wants, that we're transformed as we understand who Jesus is by the power of his spirit in his word. But they're focused on Jesus's words and Jesus's wants to the exclusion of Jesus's ways. Like that's sobering. Jesus is about making disciples. He's about calling people into a mission. Yes, he wants us to transform our wants. Yes, he wants us to fall in love with the word of God. But have we been pursuing the words of Jesus and the wants of Jesus to the exclusion of the ways of Jesus, his mission? Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it this way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a German theologian and an author. He was an anti-Nazi dissenter in World War II. And it says, Christianity without disciple making is always Christianity without Christ. That is a sobering statement. 
Christianity without disciple making is always Christianity without Christ. Why? Because Jesus is a missional God. He came here for a purpose and then he fulfilled his purposes on this earth and gave the mission to his people that he wants to live through them. Christianity without disciple making is always Christianity without Christ. So how's your disciple making going? If you're like me in the kitchen trying to make cookies, maybe you're just throwing things at the wall and I'm not sure how to do this thing. And you come out with some corrosive cookies like I did. If we want to know how to make disciples like Jesus did, firstly, we need to look at what, how Jesus defines a disciple and how to actually, it, once we know what that end goal is, how do we actually meet that goal, okay? So as Family Church, we've done some work on what a disciple is. And I want to share this with you. This is called our discipleship triangle. And we define a disciple this way. A disciple is someone following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. That's a follower of Jesus. That's a disciple. That's somebody who's saved. If you don't have one of those sides of the triangle, you're not a disciple. And you can see this reflected in the passage that we just read, right? Jesus says, follow me to Peter and Andrew, a disciple, somebody who followed Jesus. Jesus says, and I will make you, that he transforms us, that he's the one who changes us. A disciple is somebody who's being changed by Jesus. And then he says, I, I, I will make you fishers of men, that you're going to be released into a mission. A disciple is somebody who's on mission with Jesus. And so we've defined a disciple that way. So from Jesus' own words. So now that we know what a disciple is, how do we actually make them? How do we make followers of Jesus? How do we be people helping people find and follow Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Because the how, I believe is found in what we just read as well. Not only did Jesus define a disciple, he gives us some hints and some clues about how we can actually begin making disciples, begin making followers of Jesus. So we're going to look at three different things that I see from this passage and a couple other passages that will help us to actually make followers of Jesus. All right, the first thing, making followers of Jesus requires authentic relationship. Let's come back to the passage. And he said to them, follow me. The invitation to follow Jesus is not at a distance. He doesn't say like, hey, keep, keep yourself back a ways. He invites them to closeness, to authentic relationship with him. Think about the, the life they lived over the next three years. They, they went where Jesus went. They heard Jesus teach. They saw him minister and heal. They, they were with Jesus most of the time. The disciples and Jesus spent 90 some percent of their time together over those three years. If we want to be followers who, who make other followers, we must be people who have authentic relationship with Jesus. The disciples saw Jesus uh, teach, heal. They saw him in his transfigured glory and they saw him in his wrestling. Jesus invited them into all of his life. And so if we want to be followers of Jesus who make followers of Jesus, we must first have authentic relationship with Jesus ourselves. Like if I don't follow Jesus, I don't have anywhere to point you. Followers of Jesus who do not follow Jesus closely make followers of Jesus who do not follow Jesus closely. And Jesus wants authentic relationship between his people and himself. He wants us to come close. And it requires a healthy relationship between the disciple and Jesus, our God. So how's your relationship with Jesus? Here's why this is so important. As you're evaluating that question, I really do want you and I to evaluate that. Right? There are times where we ebb and flow and there are times where we walk in the wrong direction. How is your relationship with Jesus? And here's why this is so important. Healthy things multiply health. But unhealthy things multiply unhealth. And if we want to be disciples who make disciple makers and have a healthy disciple making movement that impacts our county and the world at large, 
we first have to be healthy disciples or we have nowhere to point people. Healthy things multiply health. Unhealthy things multiply unhealth. When I was living in that same trailer I told you about earlier, um, I had this cool feature in my bedroom where if you stood in the corner, you could get a cold shower when it rained. Like the rain just went straight through our roof. And for a while, it was a, you know, kind of a gradual thing that happened over time. I didn't know it was leaking. And I actually had a bookshelf up against the corner. And one day I'm cleaning my room and I pulled that bookshelf out about midwinter. It had been raining quite a bit. And behind the shelf, what was there? In the darkness and moisture, what grew? Mold and mushrooms. I had mushrooms growing out of the 1970s wood paneling in my bedroom. Why? Because a few spores got in there and the unhealth multiplied. And in fact, that winter, I had a wicked cough because, uh, uh, because of the unhealth in my room. It affected me. Unhealthy things multiply unhealth. If we want to have a healthy disciple-making movement, we need to be disciples who are following Jesus closely. Not perfectly, but closely. It begins with our relationship. And then secondly, we want to extend authentic relationship to others with us. We want, we want to extend real relationship to others. Not, not just a, a, a mask or a facade. And 2023 American culture it does not prize community. It prizes individualism. And it's so easy because of Facebook, social media, <clears throat> to, to, to put up this facade, this filter over our life and pretend like we're okay and pretend like things are better. But, and to hold everybody out there at arm's length instead of inviting them in like Jesus did. Again, come back to Jesus' call to follow him. He invites his disciples to be an intimate part of his life. And listen carefully. This can't happen on just Sunday mornings. Because it's real easy to come to church and pretend. Like I've been there. I pretend sometimes. It's even easy to come to a, a couple hour life group on a given weeknight and pretend. But if I invite you over to my house and you see me as a husband and as a father and how I treat my friends and how I deal with frustration and how I deal with difficult circumstances and how I celebrate and how I handle joy, you're going to see a window into my life that is far beyond what we, what we can find out on a given Sunday morning or a meeting. If we want to be disciples who make disciples, if we want to make followers of Jesus, we have to let people in to our lives. They need to see our joys and triumphs. They also need to see our brokenness and where God's transforming us. Because the gospel does meet real life. But if all they ever see is the shiny thing we present on Sunday or at life group or a mask that we put up, they're not going to see where the gospel actually meets being a husband, father, mother, uh, a parent, child, teacher, student. We have to be people who let people in. If we want to make disciples like Jesus, it requires authentic relationship. The next thing I want us to see in this passage is uh, making followers requires walking the transformation journey together. Jesus said it this way. He says, I will make you. Listen carefully. We don't transform anybody. Like I can barely make cookies. I'm not changing anybody's heart. It's a process that God brings his children through. A process often involving suffering. And, and there's a deeper level of surrender. But, but God says he does the transforming work. In Romans uh, chapter 12, Paul the apostle, he just got through explaining the powerful gospel and its massive ramifications for 11 chapters. And in chapter 12, he says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, look, because of the mercy of God, I'm calling you to, to lay down your life, pick up your cross, live sacrificially, listen to God and obey, All right? That's a disciple. If we were to kind of distill it down, a disciple is somebody who listens to the spirit and obeys. 
And so he's, he's calling them to this lifestyle of obedience that is worship. Worship isn't just music. It is a lifestyle of surrender to God. And then he says this, do not be conformed to this world. Man, are there not so many places that want to conform us and those we are making, the, the disciples we are making, right? The people you're discipling, they are being shoved into the conformity of culture, of their family of origin, maybe even their current nuclear family. They're being shoved into the mold of success or, or the, the conformity of, of fame or popularity or social media. There's so many uh, molds, so many places that are trying to conform them to the image of something other than Jesus. But he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word there in the original language is actually the same word that is used when Jesus is transfigured before his disciples. This is an amazing transformation. But how does it happen? By the renewal of our mind. By the renewal of our mind. Now, while we don't transform anybody, we do have a part to play in this process. And here's what I, what I often see. When we're discipling somebody and we see sin patterns in their life um, that are dangerous, it's very easy to say, stop that behavior. And all that does is create legalism. That's not transformation. If we want to help people be transformed, we want to partner with God in the transformation journey he's bringing the people we're discipling through. We must be people who are willing to say, hey, I see this behavior. I think it's dangerous. Let's ask some questions. What's going on behind this? We must be people. Our part is to help them see their areas of unbelief. All sin stems from lies that are deeply rooted in people. And if we just say, stop the behavior, we, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's behavior modification. It's not the gospel. It's not gospel transformation because that passage says the renewal begins in our minds and in our hearts where the belief is formed. The word there for mind is phroneo and it means what we, uh, what we believe about God, ourselves and others. The transformation begins here, not here. And you may, be, you may see somebody's behavior get worse as they're wrestling through their beliefs. But we have to be people who, who are willing to go to the depth of the root of the problem and not just knock the behavior off. So once we've, we've pointed out their areas of unbelief, it's not like, hey, um, here's the problem. Believe the gospel. Yes, of course we want people to believe the gospel. But when somebody's brokenness is revealed, we need to be a safe place for them. We need to be a safe place for them to be real, honest, and transparent with us. And then we need to walk with them in those areas. Walk with them through those areas. That we don't just abandon them. Listen, sometimes the transformation journey is brutal. Like people are messy. Sin is ugly. And sometimes in our disciple-making relationships, that is going to be brought to the fore. And you're going to be looking at something that is overwhelming, that is maybe dark, that is evil. And you're going to be like, I don't know how to do this. I'm out. Right? That's a tendency. I've been there. But if we want to see people truly transformed, we have to be willing to walk with them in those areas. This doesn't mean that we own their brokenness or we wear their, their mess. All that is required is that we be a present presence, that we're there. We're, we're with them in the pit because that's what Jesus did. He came down from a perfect place into our darkness to be here with us, that he might lift us out of it. And so if we want to be people, helping people find and follow Jesus through this transformative, transformative journey, we must be people who walk with them in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their transformation journey. And the next thing, and this is so important to disciple making, our part is to teach them to listen to the Spirit. You and I have a window into their life, but the Spirit is only one who can take those roots that we find and replace them with the truth, the voice of God. 
We must be people who teach them to listen to the Spirit. And I, I talked about this a couple months ago as I talked about my journey of, of listening to the Spirit and how weird it felt. I read a book called uh, Chair Time. And in the book, you're supposed to sit for 15 minutes in silence before God. Just thank him for 60 seconds and then sit silently, not asking for anything, not bringing your worries, your concerns up, just listening. And I had somebody come up to me the next week and say, man, I tried that. That's so dumb. <laughs> like I didn't hear anything except for the sound of my hungry tummy. And, and, and I get that. And it does feel awkward in a, in a, fast-paced world where we have noise all around us and, and noise going in here all the time to stop and listen. But again, a disciple is somebody who listens and obeys the Spirit. If we want to help them in their transformative journey, we have to be people who point them in the direction of how do you actually listen to the Spirit? Take some silent moments before God, reflecting on His Word silently before Him. Ask him, what, what are you saying to me through this passage? What are you saying to me in this moment of silence before you, God? And the next thing, and I, I think this is also just so important, point out their growth. The people you're discipling, they don't see it probably. Point out their growth. <laughs> like it gets so discouraging when I can only view my life through my eyes because I don't always see my growth. And it, it takes a friend to, to, for, uh, from the outside to say, hey man, the, you know, this, this difficult conversation didn't knock you down for as long as it used to. A year ago, you, you really would have been out for a week and, and now you, 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 you're wrestling for a couple hours. That's growth. And, and we need to be people who call out and celebrate the growth that God has brought into others. Because when they look back and they can see, God did this in me. I didn't see it before, but thank you for pointing it out. It gives us faith to move forward for what God's going to do next. If we want to help people in their transformation journey, we need to be willing to point out unbelief. We need to be willing to walk with them through it. We need to be willing to teach them to follow the, and listen to the Spirit. And we need to be willing to point out the growth. It's so important. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. That's our part of that journey. And lastly, making followers requires releasing them into the mission. I love this. Coming back to the statement in Matthew 4, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Again, Jesus brings us up at the very beginning conversation about what their relationship is going to be like. He says, look, this is what your life is going to be about. No longer are you fishermen. You're going to be about the kingdom of God and fishing for people to come into the kingdom of God. And, and all throughout his ministry, he provides opportunities and moments and he teaches towards the mission. He provides opportunities for them to experience the mission. He sends them out two by two and they come back and they're like, holy smokes, like cool stuff happened, Jesus. Jesus' ministry was about pointing people to the mission and preparing them for it. And this is the first conversation he has with them about it. But I want to look at the last one too. Matthew chapter 28. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. So there's the disciples, right? These, these common men, and they see Jesus, and some throw themselves at his feet. They're just in awe. And others are like, I don't know about this. Like the last week got pretty hairy, you know, like when you died. Uh, I'm not sure that I can continue down this road, Jesus. And there's this worship mingled with doubt, and I love Jesus' response to this. Look at this. This is the graciousness of our Savior. He says, and Jesus came. I believe it's the NIV says, and Jesus came to them. He came to them. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't belittle them. He doesn't say, get up. Come on. Quit your doubting. I'm here. Like, touch my hands. He comes to them. And then he gives them the greatest mission. These doubting, common, unlearned, at times faithless men who had just deserted him the week prior. That's who he gives the mission to. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <laughs> What's the only proper response to somebody who has all authority? Total surrender. He says, all authority has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. He says, go, therefore. 
go is literally as you are going. And we've been talking about the local mission field, that as we go into our neighborhoods, the marketplace where we live, work, and play, that we're to be on mission, making disciples who make disciples. And in the next few weeks, we're going to look at what this looks like globally. But for our sake today, he says, go where you live, where you work, where you play, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the first step of obedience for a follower. And teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's a lifelong journey of obedience. Jesus gave this mission to a bunch of buffoons. Like if we were to write a book about the disciples, it would be called Adventures and Missing the Point. There's so many times where they're arguing and they don't understand what Jesus is doing and they get it wrong. But Jesus has poured into them. He has uh, prepared them for the mission and now he's releasing them in it. And here's why God can use such common people like you and I. This statement, behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. It's not about us. He's with us. The spirit of God lives in us. And the church is the people of God living out the mission of God by the power of the spirit of God. You and I are the commoners just like the disciples. And we're called to live out this mission. As we were uh, preparing this this message, um, I, I was talking with the teaching team. And I don't know if you guys know who's on the teaching team, but it's the campus pastors uh, and Pastor Jeremy, the family pastor from uh, the Sutherland campus. And then there's Heather Jones. She's been on the team for a long time, uh, our life groups director. And Shauna Murphy uh, joined the team for us uh, this year. She's the care ministry director and the women's ministry director. And, and uh, we, we began to get excited as we heard this mission of God and, and that he's calling common people like you and I into it. And so we began to share stories. Like, who was it that impacted you? And I just wanted to share some of those stories. Listen to this. Pastor Jeremy was impacted by a basketball coach that helped him see that he's not just a fan of Jesus, but he's a follower of Jesus and helped him walk in obedience. Pastor Drew had a seventh grade teacher and a neighbor who poured into him and cared for him and helped him understand what it meant to walk out a lifelong journey of obedience. Heather met the gospel on a car lot from a wholesaler that her and husband, her and her husband heard it from. Shauna was surrounded by common people in the midst of crisis who loved her just like Jesus. Uh, myself, I was at an emo show at the Grange in Roseburg, an emo concert. And there's this weird guy there who's praying over the concert and talking to kids about Jesus. My wife, uh, uh, she, she watched as her mother an ext- the most gracious woman I know live day in and day out a faith journey in Jesus, in obedience, on mission, following him. What's the common denominator of all these people? They're not pastors. They're not elders. They're not the spiritually elite people. These are common people that in, uh, were given an uncommon mission of, of helping others come to know Christ. And that gives me so much hope. Because that means you and I can do this. We can be partners in the gospel. I want to come back to something that Heather Jones said at the beginning of this series that I thought was so profound. She said, if you want a front row seat to watch God do his thing, make disciples. There is no greater joy than watching faith well up in another person. So as we, as we make followers of Jesus who live out the transformative journey with us and, and who live out the mission, we will truly see God do the miraculous. I'm going to release to the campuses. Love you guys. Thank you so much for sticking around and hanging out with us today as we looked at what it means to be people helping people find and follow Jesus, what it looks like to have that lifelong journey of transformation and obedience. And I want to just leave us with two questions. The first one is, who are you discipling? Who's your, who's your disciple? What does that relationship look like? And, and here's kind of a, 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 a thing to think through. Is the process you're taking your disciple through replicable 
Is it reproducible? Can they then take the process you've brought them through and do that with somebody else? Here's what this can look like. If, if, if every time the person I'm discipling comes to me and asks the question and I just give them the answers, that's, that's not a reproducible process. Because what's going to happen when their disciple has, it, has questions? Are they just going to come to me? Instead, leading through a, a line of questions and helping them to wrestle through finding the answer for themselves. So is your disciple-making relationship a reproducible process? Think of that person right now. Can they take what you have helped them walk through and do it with somebody else? If not, it's not a reprodu reproducible process like Jesus walked his disciples through, right? And the second thing I want to I challenge us with is does your method of disciple-making match Jesus's? When I first started making disciples, I did what I like to affectionately call coffee house discipleship. I'd meet with, with students or parents uh, as a youth pastor uh, for an hour or two at a coffee shop and I'd pour into them. And that, that's okay. That's not bad. But that's not the end all be all. You see, Jesus didn't meet with his disciples once a week for an hour or so. He did life with them. So who is God calling you to invite into your life? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are a missional God who came on mission, sent your son on mission to pursue common, sinful, and broken people just like myself. And I pray, God, that as we hear from your word a challenge to live out this mission, that you would help us to do so with uh, courage and boldness. God, I pray for those of us who hear the call to mission and we're freaked out that you would give us courage and bravery, um, that we would be empowered by your spirit and not look to ourselves, but look to you to do the true transformative work in those we are discipling. Thank you so much, God, that we don't do this alone, that Jesus' own words are, you are with us even to the very end of the age. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks again for hanging out with us. Love you.